but we will start with this regulation line of thought that has been very uh, influential in political science uh, and start with uh, regulated collective action, which is the, the second part of, of this presentation. And I will show you a picture of a man here. Uh, perhaps someone recognized this man. It's Thomas Hobbes, famous uh, political theorist and philosopher, uh, who's uh, been quite influential in political theory when it comes to basically problems of collective action and basically the legitimacy of the state to some extent. He wrote a book, a uh, very influential book called Leviathan. I think some of you might have heard about it at least, uh, which uh, Leviathan is a biblical sea monster, which in the world of, of Hobbes represent the state. But his point of departure in Hobbes thinking was something of the imagined state of nature that was the point of departure for his philosophy. So you should imagine a state of nature, which he describes here as a society uh, that is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This is an imagined state of nature. I, I've heard about the uh, misinterpretation who uh, thought it was solitary, poor, nasty, British, in short. Uh, but I think it should be British. But uh, anyhow, uh, this is the idea, an imagined state of nature that Hobbes explained in, in this Leviathan book. Uh, I think he, he, he doesn't say that this is a historical moment. It has, this has never appeared, but it's more of a point of departure for the thinking of Hobbes. Uh, what will happen if people live in these imagined state of nature. Hobbes uh, think that in this type of society there will be the war of all against all, basically. People will fight each other for survival. Uh, people are egoistic and will try to do anything uh, to attain power in this uh, type of society. Uh, there's no cooperation uh, at all. Basically, people cannot solve a collective action problem. They will never come together and solve collective issues because they are egoistic and rational. And this basically, this idea of people being these rational, egoistic, kind of autistic uh, people, this, this echoes in, in uh, later works in political science and economics. Uh, the rational choice theory is influenced by the thinking of Hobbes uh, that people will never, never cooperate. Uh, so the idea, uh, basically from Hobbes and onwards, is that we need something, a third party to step in and do something. That is the Leviathan, this monster. That is the state, basically. So Hobbes thinks that without this state, we will not uh, attain, we will not reach collective action. So we need some kind of third party, some external authority. And now we, we see this as the state uh, who, who steps in and solve dilemmas of collective action, basically, through regulations. Uh, basically, by, in different ways, changing the incentive structure in favor of cooperation. So that is basically set account regulations uh, saying, basically, that if you try to kill another man or woman, you, you go to prison, or, 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 uh, or basically these type of, of basic regulations. So, so to change the incentive structure, so these egoistic people will type, come align and, and force uh, collective action to come through. And basically politics, seen this way, is, is basically trying to promoting collective action uh, when it's not taking place voluntarily. And now we are at the core of the political science uh, ish, uh, subject in a way, uh, because this um, is, is basically the justification for the state, that through the state, through the power of the third party, collective action is possible. So the Hobbesian answer to uh, the problem of AMR will be regulation, force people, and of course, this is uh, basically the system uh, present, uh, presently used, of course, to, to a large extent when it comes to, to AMR. Uh, in Sweden, you need a prescription from a doctor to, to attain antibiotics. So, so this seems to be the solution, perhaps, to this problem also. But the idea here is that we have to think about the limitation about the Hobbesian way of solving collective action dilemmas. 
Uh, and this uh, is illustrated here by a quote in an article in uh, Health Policy a few years ago saying that just talking about how to regulate antibiotics use, that many of these regulatory aspects may well be only uh, existent on paper, but not properly implemented. So it's one thing to, um, to, to, uh, to uh, decide upon regulations, but uh, if they're not enforced and not implemented, they're only on paper, they won't change this dilemma in any way. Uh, so, and also when it comes to regulating this issue of antibiotic resistance, there is, I would say, uh, a particularly problematic in many ways because regulating an issue which is, there is a lot of uh, asymmetric information where the doctors or the healthcare personnel has more information basically than the payer or the provider of, of certain uh, healthcare uh, uh, services, and then it might be easy to uh, build up system prone to co uh, corruption. So, and this has been explained by the former health minister in in Romania when it comes to the issue of antibiotic resistance. The former health minister Vlad Voiculescu, who just make the the connection between corruption and antibiotic resistance, saying basically that corruption generates antibiotic resistance. In societies where there is corruption, rules are broken, therapy guidelines and protocols are not respected, pharmaceutical drugs are released without prescription, measures to isolate patients infected with multi-resistant germs are not respected. So this is a man, a uh, former minister in Romania, where there is not only a lot of corruption, there's corruption in the healthcare system, as well as quite substantial use of antibiotics as well and resistance levels. So, so this man should know. Uh, and this issue is quite interesting. So me and a colleague at the political science department wanted to look at this in, in, in more detail. So we want to study thinking about the healthcare issues being a uh, uh, area or, or, or a sector where, which is prone to corruption and also then look into the connection between uh, corruption and bribery and antibiotic use. So we, we made a study a couple of years ago where we looked into this relationship. So we, we, we wanted to investigate the, the uh, association between consumptions of antibiotics in European regions and also uh, the presence of bribery and corruption. Uh, we, we looked at actually two indicators of corruption, one specific corruption in the healthcare sector and one uh, more general, the prevalence of bribery in societies. Basically, we asked people, is it common in your country to use bribe to obtain public services? And also we uh, ask people uh, if they think that there is corruption in the healthcare sector. It's quite difficult to, to do research on this, I should say. Uh, if you ask people, do you use bribes to obtain public service? No, 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 no. But if you ask in general, how is it in, in your country, in your region? Yeah, 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 that's quite common. So, so um, actually, this is quite a common way to, to, uh, to investigate prevalence of corruption. So we wanted to study this also on the regional level. We study Europe uh, because there is quite good data. Uh, uh, on, on corruption, and we also obtain data on the regional level. Uh, when it comes to corruption. And this is quite important because there is substantial regional variation in the use of antibiotics as well. Uh, we used survey data, which is not optimal, but it's there to study if people say if they have been using antibiotics for the last um, 12 months or so. And we correlated that with these measures of bribery and corruption. Uh, so we studied that in Europe. And also, uh, this uh, interesting uh, variation within country variation in, in antibiotic use. So uh, it might be a general so that we consume less antibiotics in the northern part of Europe and, and more so in, in the southern part. But there's actually substantial variation within countries, which is interesting. 
because it it also allow you to to uh, to some extent take into account the variation in regulatory structure within countries. But we studied this and also controlled for a number of factors that could kind of confound this relationship. And then we found, I should show you, it doesn't, uh, perhaps if you see this, uh, you don't have to, to read all the names, but that's actually the regions. Uh, but you see here the, the, um, the uh, association between corruption in the healthcare sector and uh, the use of antibiotics. There is, uh, of course, not a perfect correlation, but it, it's, uh, it's there. More corruption is, is linked to more use of antibiotics. Uh, so this has also been studied actually at the country level. When we prepared our article, there was also an article out on the country level. We talked about the, uh, the uh, advantage of studying this at the regional level, but there, this is interesting study who study corruption and also in relation to not use of antibiotics, but instead antibiotic resistance. Uh, so this is a, a paper in, in PLOS One uh, uh, some years ago, and there has been uh, more research uh, looking into this interesting relationship. But uh, when we, we look at these type of studies, it's, it's interesting to see the correlation basically, but we all have to think about what are actually the mechanisms involved here. Why do we see these links between corruption and antibiotic resistance and antibiotic use? So I think when we, uh, we have been thinking about this, uh, it seems to be that it could be uh, both the relationship between the healthcare sector and possibly uh, industry, uh, sector, if there is not transparency and control, that might be driving uh, use of antibiotics. But it could also be that in, in many countries, as I said, people use bribes to obtain uh, uh, public services. And, and we know that in very many countries, in particularly Eastern Europe, there is it's very common to use bribe to obtain healthcare services. That's basically what you need to do to, to obtain things that you should be obtaining for free, but so so. But uh, this is is uh, is complicated, and the studies so far on this issue has not been able to to study the mechanisms. But uh, they are, it's interesting to think about them actually. But in general, this points to the limitation, in a way, uh, to some extent, of of the thinking of Hobbes here, uh, because uh, if you go want to go the uh, hard way of Hobbes and okay, we should regulate, regulate, regulate this. We know that it's quite tricky to get that working in, in high corrupt societies. So even if you have regulations, we know that there is usually things to go around these regulations. So so it's quite tricky to to uh, regulate antibiotic use to some extent. So so we have to think about other ways also. As I promised you, the Hobbesian way is not the only one. We can also think about other uh, attempts to, to study this, to, to, to do something.